Hi, I'm Jazz Obert, and welcome to my Talking Guitar podcast with Charlie Watts. In the summer of 1994, I was hired to put together a magazine that the Rolling Stones could sell at their venues and that they could be sold on newsstands. So I flew to Toronto, where the Rolling Stones had rented a boys' school to do their rehearsing during the summer of that year. I was especially thrilled to be talking to Charlie Watts because he'd been a favorite drummer of mine ever since I first heard him play on Get Off of My Cloud. My first encounter with Charlie took place on the shuttle bus, taking me from the Four Seasons Hotel to the venue. On the drive over, Charlie entertained all of us with this story he had about his wife talking him out of buying a gigantic Stetson hat. When we landed at the venue, Watts got out of the van first, and then he turned around and he helped each, each passenger off. I was the last person to disembark, and as I was getting off, Charlie introduced himself and I explained who I was and he asked me what I was doing here and he said, oh, you're the person I'm going to interview? Good. So a little while later, we met in a cafeteria. Now, I was forewarned that Charlie's modesty made, could make him a difficult interview subject. So I did my homework and when we sat down, I had in front of me a list of some, some of Charlie's favorite jazz drummers from the 30s and 40s. This conversation you're about to hear took place on July 14th 1994. I hope you enjoy it. Go on. Charlie, if you could go back in time to visit any musical period or see any artists, who would be the first you'd like to see? Hello. Uh Loads of them in there. I'd love to have gone to the Savoy Ball and Chick Web, I think. Really? Yeah. Um, I'd love to have seen Ellington at Cotton Club and have dressed up for the occasion. <laughs> I'd love to have seen Charlie Parker when at the Royal Roost or something like that. And uh, I don't know. Louis Armstrong, probably, Roseland Ballroom, yeah. Chicago. Which era? 1930, with a big band behind them. Really? Yeah, I like uh, Armstrong with a big band. I, I mean, I like the Hot Seven and all those, but I mean, I like him with a big band. Did you like Joe Jones? Yes, I just bought a record of Joe Jones. Shoe Shine Boy. Uh-huh. Joe Jones special, yes. I saw him play quite a few times, Joe Jones. Have you ever looked up any of... Joe Jones, you mean, do Pardon me? Count Basie Joe Right, Jones. not yeah, Philly yeah. Joe, regular yeah. Joe. Papa Joe. Have you ever looked up any of the historical drummers like Ray, Roy Haynes or... I know Roy Haynes. I know Mickey Roker. Really? Yeah. I mean, I've met them. What's They're your impressions nice of their drum drumming? What do you like I think about Roy Haynes is a wonderful player. But uh, no, I mean, to look up people, you mean you're talking about Chick Webb or, or um, I mean, my, one of my favorite drummers, Davy Tuff. Mm -hmm. I don't know anything about him. Really. I've never heard of him. Who's he with? Davy Tuff? No. He was one of the Austin High School gang out of Chicago in the 30s. Uh huh. Played with all the big bands, and he played with the famous. First heard Woody Herman. He's the drummer on Caledonia mm -hmm. and Northwest Passage and all that. It's fantastic. He's a legend. Every band leader wanted him in the 30s. What made these guys? A skinny so guy. Skinny and another guy. guy um, another guy I'd love to have seen play as a drummer, as we were talking about, is Big Sid Catlett, who was around oh, the yeah. same era. Big Sid. They were the two drummers that were the famous too, with right. Big Sid and uh, and uh, Davy Tuff. Davy Tuff was a skinny white man, really skinny, um, and was really loud player apparently, from what I've gathered, asking people like Mel Lewis about him. Yeah, and uh, and Big Sid was a huge black man but very light right 
So they got totally contrary in this stature, the way they played, which is very strange. Armit Ertikin's the only one I actually asked a lot about. Armit's very interesting, and his brother was in his nest. What can a what could a, a young rock drummer today gain from going back and listening to these players that you've mentioned? That uh, it's nothing really new. <laughs> Georgie Wetland is one of the great Chicago drummers. Mm -hmm. the great, great, great Chicago. Fantastic. In fact, Georgie Wetland is is more, better documented than than lots of people. He used to play with Eddie Condon, though. He's a fantastic drummer. And he is so subtle. It's mm -hmm. like Freddie Bilo is a very subtle drummer, really, although he's feet first and it's noisy. Yeah. But it's actually very subtle, the pickups he does. You know, if you hear. I mean, the thing with blues bands, like records, you never quite know who's on them, really. And it's all up to whether Ron Mayo wrote the name down correctly on the day. And if you go further back, you never yeah. know what's on them. So if Freddie Bilo is the player on Smokestack Light, Lightning, mm -hmm. or Howling Wolf, yeah. that's really clever drumming. That, Do you that isn't just straight ahead. That he, he, that he plays lovely things with his feet. As opposed to Odie Payne? I don't know who that is. You have to another. play a record for me yeah. tonight. Below, I know of. And uh, seen, but uh, you know, there's a lot of guys that are t unheard of, really, who play, you know, wonderfully. I think. I yeah. mean, I personally like band drummers. All the drummers I'd mentioned, what I admire about all the records I have of Roy Haynes, for example, yeah. are all rhythm. Records. There's some, you know, the Coltrane thing, a different drummer with drums. He did some wonderful records with um, uh, Roland Kirk mm -hmm. out for the afternoon, all those. But it's not the drum solos I like, yeah. it's, it's the, the rhythm section drumming. Like Max Roach is another one like that, who's a phenomenal player. Who, who was your favorite player with Miles on drums? And Miles don't have a favorite. He had a, he had a way of putting bands together from we never heard of them. My favorite drummer, I suppose, on record would be Philly Joe Jones, and uh, and to see play live Tony Williams by a long way. Why Tony? And Tony, more important, really. Well, he turned drumming round. He played. He, nobody played like Tony Williams. Did when he was 18. When I first saw him, he was 18. What was so Nobody different? Nobody played like that. Well, you didn't drop, you didn't drop time on your hand. Philly Joe would ride, you know, and it would be straight through. Right. Tony would drop. Have you got the album uh, Four and More? No. Oh, well, that's a classic example that's it. of Tony Williams' way of playing the drums. You know, he'd drop. He would. The way I play and the way most guys till he arrived would be to play straight through. You know? One, yeah. two, one, two, one, two, one, two, foot, foot, left foot, right foot, left foot. Yeah. Do you, do you Tony would go t -t 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 with his left foot. Nobody ever did that sort of thing. Uh -huh. they, they didn't play time like that. He would drop time, he would halve it. And him and Ron Carter invented this way of playing. Paul, you know a guy called Scott Lafaro, the bass player? Mm -hmm. oh, I've yeah. heard the him, name, I don't know. Him and Paul Moshan used to do it with um, Bill Evans. Mm -hmm. they, 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 they'd play an, a time inside the time. And nothing would be keeping time except one note on the bass would be the anchor. Mm -hmm. I saw you play at the Arms concert. Oh, was that with, oh, Ken, yeah. with Kenny Jones? Yeah. And it was so astonishing to see Kenny's gigantic setup. And here you are with the most basic thing you, rig you probably could have gone out with. Have you always That's what I've always played. I have a hard enough job playing them. I don't really want to play more. <laughs> have you always admired ele the elegance and simplicity? Yeah. I mean, that's one of the good... Mickey Roke is a beautiful-looking drummer. Beastful? Beautiful. Beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. It just is wonderful. 
Philly Jones. Elvin's like that. When Elvin Jones gets going, it rolls. Mm -hmm. you know, it just, it's like it's like thunder and everything. But to watch him, it just rolls around. You know. Yeah. Keith, you know, the arms go. Yeah. Uh, a guy called when I was young, my favourite drummer was a guy called Joe Morello. And Joe Morello was all taste and elegance in his playing. Mm -hmm. Superb ears. I mean, he used to, and technique. Yeah. You know, it's very hard to play with just a piano. Piano, bass, and drums is one of the hardest things for a drummer to play. Mm -hmm. Because of what the, the textures you have to use. Do you play in styles that people who know you from your jazz records or the Stone records wouldn't be aware of? I'm not aware of them. Do you play um, every day when you're not working? No. What's the longest you'll go without playing? Oh, I don't know. Yeah. Are you? Do you collect drum sets? I used or? to practice every day. I don't anymore. Mm -hmm. Do I collect what drums? Like historical uh, drums or? Yeah. If I see, yeah, I collect anything, not any drum. Mm -hmm. I do. I collect anything, and uh, the lovely old drums are lovely. I collect snare drums. Really, the most people, most drummers collect snare. Drums. Yeah. But I have a lot of them. Well, a lot. You know, Twenty odd. And they go back to about 1926. Right? Have you ever used an old old set on a record? No, I've got I've got an old 1926 drum kit, you know, with mm -hmm. all the they're called tracks, with all the yeah. things on the top. I've got one of those. I don't really like those, you know. I like the forties type ones. What's your all-time favorite setup? Like what make? Got mine. Make is like, great. The one I've got behind the curtain downstairs is very good. It's a 1960 black Gretsch. Eight, Tony Williams one, 18 inch bass drum. Have you yeah. used it a long time? I'm playing, no, I, I bought it about a year ago and I've been playing it here. Mm -hmm. Not, I've been messing about with it myself at the back, behind the curtain. Yeah. But the one I've got now that I play is, is uh, my, my favorite wow. kit. I've used it on, my jazz record things that I do, the stone stuff. It's got great. a great sound. Yeah, I bought it. I, I first, used, a guy, a boy from SIR, bought it along to Ronnie Woods when we were making, and Ronnie will tell you what album it was, I've forgotten, in Los Angeles, and I fell in love with it. It's 58, I think, great. Mm -hmm. So I have uh, a few. Well, most of my drums, snare drums, I've got mixtures of leaders and all that. Yeah. But most of my kits are great. I have a green and gold plated, green glitter and gold plated Gretsch kit from about 1958. I had that done because I saw Mel Lewis with uh, Stan Kenton when mm -hmm. I was a kid. And some guy offered me a green glitter. They're fantastic. And so I had it gold plated. <laughs> it's a lovely thing. Yeah. Well, I don't think I'll ever use it though, but it's just a lovely looking thing. Keith mentioned that you took a much more active role on, on Voodoo Lounge than you had on past projects. And where did he say that? It's uh, in the pink section of the San Francisco oh. Chronicle. No, I didn't. I don't know. He mentioned like you had recorded in a stairwell and then tried different things and were oh, more yeah. involved with the mix and. and well, I don't know. I wasn't that involved with the mixes. Hmm. I mean, I, I just, I was probably just talking to Don Was or Don Smith. Yeah. What's the monster sound on Through and Through? That is a stairwell. You know, it's, a, I, it's on four or five songs on the album. Yeah. You got me rocking. What's the other one? Through. Oh, uh, and I play a trash can in the stairwell in, uh, on uh, Moon Is Up. Mm -hmm. It's a huge, it's a four flight stairwell. And I was started off at the top, which is Moon Is Up, 
and I landed up at the bottom plane, <laughs> you got me rocking, and through and through. Literally? You set yeah. it up on each yeah. stairwell? It was, we were, the studio at the top, uh -huh. it's like going down them, yeah. except it's, hot, it's um, open all the way down. So we started off out by the door there, Yeah. and then uh, Don Smythe said, uh, would you go to the bottom and try it? It's a bit small down there, but it was all right. Yeah. The problem is you can't hear anything down there except drums. So a tremendous sound. What are your observations on playing with Daryl? They're easy. And I don't mean that um, comfortably easy. I mean, it's very comfortable to play with. He's a rhythm section player. Well, he, the role he plays with us he's doing that. I don't know what, how he would play if we were in a different type of... I, I think someone as talented as Daryl could play anything. Yeah. But, but, you know, I mean, that's... That's what being a professional musician is about. One side of it, you know, being right. able to do these things. Um, with us, he, he's a very um, quick pick things up and very, um, very much a rhythm section, within a rhythm section. He, he doesn't play on top mm -hmm. of, the, of the rhythm, he, he's underneath it, which is what we need, really. It's how Foundation. Build it. Yeah. yeah. You, know, you, can't, you, you can't have someone going over the top because there's no room then. And yeah. There's nothing at the bottom and no room for anybody else to do. So I actually find him very comfortable to play with. He's a, a very nice man as well, which is yeah. half of it, you know. I mean, we, when we did the particular auditions, I've never auditioned people before for anything. I haven't. So, and I, we auditioned them. Like lots of guys, you know. And we landed up with three or four, and really it was a question once, you know, there's a certain caliber of musician that can do the job. Yeah. And uh, it's then a question of do, do you think or do you, and then you hope you're going to get on with this guy for the next two years you're going to be together. <laughs> yeah. And I think he seems very nice. In well, a, he is, I know that. Yeah. In an interview we did with uh, Bill Wyman about 10 or 12 years ago, he said that. He thought the Rolling St the difference between the Rolling Stones and Stones and most rock bands were the Rolling Stones followed the rhythm guitarist, who's Keith Richards. Yeah. Is there is there true. truth in that? Yeah. Yeah, I always that's what I always do. I I don't need to hear the rest of the band if Keith is there. I mean, in, now it's different because you have PAs that are so good, you know. Yeah. But at one time, that's all I could he ever hear. Was his guitar? Well, I used to have the amplifier right next to me. I still do, but I mean, the, like, it was essential at one time when you didn't have any monitors and that, or they were really not very good. Uh huh. He was often criticized, or I don't know if that's the right word, for turning the beat around. Who? Keith. Well, I suppose we all. I mean, the thing with me and Keith is that. Um, we just have a go at things, <laughs> and if they do you know, sometimes they work, you know. I mean, analysing it all after is another thing, you know, it's for somebody else to do. Yeah. We just enjoy playing, you know. Yeah. And I just follow what he's doing. What do you have to do to get ready for an ordeal like you're about to undergo? To get in physical oh, well, shape? Oh, yeah, you do. I mean, you Long rehearsals really is what I do, because there's no way you can practice doing this. At, you know, you have to get all these, get going, you know, your hands used to going. It, 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 you, you never really reach that until you've done two or three shows, you know. Mm -hmm. you, you're, just, you're just trying to condition yourself so that your arms don't ache or, yeah. you know. It's not really the aching, it's actually um, cramp that you get in your hand anywhere yeah. anywhere in your body you know you suddenly you're not doing anything all of a sudden you're doing this for two hours 
constantly very hard mm -hmm. and uh, it causes certain reactions so we, we, I personally spend at least six months uh, six weeks practicing that whole yeah the earth is good most of the time it's physically getting conditioned for it so that you can get to a church you know we we sometimes we are say 10 hours a day to, to, for that reason i do mm -hmm. you know, i don't know how the others look at it got no idea the problems aren't the same with the guitar player you know yeah with the dr a drum is, a drum is a very physical thing drumming yeah that's that's what i meant yeah well i stretch but I do, see, I do that anyway. I don't really do anything special except uh, practice when, when I'm re rehearsing, practicing with the drums. I never practice with drums at home. I mean, I'm not doing anything. If you had a, a child who wanted, do. who wanted to become oh. a professional rock drummer, would you su suggest a I course would, of, a would course say of be, learning? No, I'd say be a drummer, not a rock drummer. What the fuck's a rock drummer? I mean, I don't know what a rock drummer is. Bonham. Well, that's what that's John Bonham playing with Led Zeppelin. Mm -hmm. Is that rock and roll? You know, it's oh, part of it, I, sure. What would I say to him? I wouldn't say anything. I mean, would you suggest a course of study or yeah. people he should listen to? Yeah, I'd say learn to play the learn to read music and learn and listen to other people other than John Bonham. Now you've got totally the wrong impression of that, what I just said, I can see in your face. John Bonham is the best at being John Bonham and doing right. what he does, or did. Mm -hmm. Fortunately he's dead. He was the best. There wasn't anyone better than John at that. Mm -hmm. And thank goodness we've got some records where he's really, that you can hear. But there are a lot of other people. Ginger Baker was a much better drummer than John Bonham. If He's you really want to know about drumming. He's Ginger still Baker, I know. Ginger Baker is the best drummer to emigrate out of England, really, Ginger. Really? And the guy who Ginger idolized, lived with, whatever the word was, we all did, was a guy called Phil Seaman. And Ginger learned everything off Phil. But Ginger can read, you know. Ginger's not a fool. Yeah. He's not what you, you know. He, he can read music. He, he he has wonderful chops. He has rudiments down. I mean, said all that, I don't. So, really? No. So I'm. T I would say to so anyone, not 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 only my offspring, but anyone. That's what you should do, really. Otherwise, you're locked in to play, doing what I do, which is fine. It worked for me, but it doesn't necessarily mean. And yeah. the most important thing of all of this is to be you. You know, there's a load of people who play brilliant drums, yeah. but there's only one Billy Higgins. There's only one Elvin Jones. Yeah. There's only one, and the reason there's only one of them is their personality, and Elvin is a, a huge black dynamo, you know, and that's what he's, when you listen to him go, that's what he sounds like, he, and it doesn't have to be fast, I mean, it is this machine guy, yeah. and I, I, it, it's not a machine that's uh, clicking regular, it's this what Miles used to call it, between the beats. Right. It's African, I mean, it's what he is. You know? And Ginger's the same. Ginger is this skinny, huge white man who plays like this monstrous. But Ginger played like that when he was 20. I saw, I used to see him play. Before Cream? Yeah. God, I used to play with a Alexis. He took over from a band in England with me from his Alexis, but I used to know him before that. 1960. I think I first saw Ginger playing 59. I think. Hey, he was bloody good then. Yeah. I don't mean good. I mean bloody. Good. I mean he was good enough to be in. Him and Jack Bruce used to play one of the best, or the most excited, if it wasn't the best, jazz groups in London. And you don't get in those bands by being half good. You know, yeah. you're very good. Because there's a load of guys who are very good. 
Did you hear Ginger on the Masters of Reality record? No. I kind of lost track of Ginger's recording career because he disappeared in uh, to Italy at one time. I wanted him to play in an orchestra I had, but I could never track him down. That'd be great. Yeah. It would have been. I, I, I had another guy. But, but it, it were, yeah, I would have... Well, I say, I don't know. I'm worried. I yeah. speak to Jack Bruce quite a bit. Are you, are you a fan of African drummers? Yeah, any drummer should be a fan of African drummers. It's like saying, do you like Brazilian music? Could you recommend records for people who are uninitiated? Not really. They're unpronounceable, lots of the names. I just know the records, you know? Yeah. Yeah, I think. And Mustafa Tati is one. There's loads of them. You know, I don't really know. But nearly everyone in Africa can <laughs> play something like that. And when they, when you get into the realm of good and very good, they are some incredible players. Like in Brazil, you know, they those guys play a tambourine like nobody else. If you stand next to a Brazilian at carnival playing a tambourine, it's a it's like Count Basie going. It is. It's incredible. I mean, I've seen them, you know, they do it, and, and there'll be t 20 of them doing it. It's amazing sound. Yeah. But that's, that. they walk like that, you know. I wish I could have heard the drum. Africans walk different to what I do. Yeah. And that's how they play, you know. I read that in um, the Congo Square of New Orleans, before recording began, two or three hundred people used to get, get together and pound out that's rhythms. That's second line, they call it. Yeah. But that, yeah, but you know, yeah, but people, entertainment was like that then. It's not like that. In Brazil, they still have, they start rehearsing for the carnival nine months before the carnival. Mm -hmm. And uh, they, they all submit songs and play them, each little society. Yeah. And they're fantastic. It's like, uh, it's like a huge, great band of uh, musicians just playing all these songs that everybody else is submitting. You have to choose the winner. Yeah. And that winner goes on and on and on, and they rehearse it all with the dancers, and they land up at the carnival and try and win the carnival. They do it in Trinidad as well. Yeah. Did you share Mick and Keith's enthusiasm for blues music when you were young? No. I learned the blues through a man called Cyril Davis. And Alexis Corner. And from them two, I met Mick and Keith. And Brian first, then Mick and Keith. And I used to play in the, this band with Jack Bruce. And uh, Keith and Mick used to sit in sometimes, and Brian would come down. And then when I joined the Rolling Stones, I used to play with a lot of other bands as well. Yeah. And. Uh, well, when I joined the Rolling Stones, I used to sit around, and Keith taught me, uh, Keith and Brian taught me Jimmy Reed, really. Well, they, they used to play it all the time. We used right. to do a lot of their numbers, so I learned it through them. He also taught me uh, to enjoy uh, Elvis Presley through DJ Fontana, mm -hmm. who I think is a wonderful player. But before that, I never used to listen to him. There's only one record I ever liked of Elvis before. No, I didn't really. The blues to me before that was um, Now's the Time by Charlie Parker. That was the blues to me. Or West End Blues by Louis Armstrong. Yeah. But that was the blues. I didn't, if you're talking about uh, sort of rural blues, right. Chicago blues and rural, yeah, no, I didn't know any of them really. Cyril was the first one to play me um, Muddy Waters. Given your broad taste for, for jazz music, did it ever seem restricting doing what you do with the Stones? No. Or frustrating? No. Rock and roll is restricting. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, 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 it's on the whole time. There's no budging. If you budge, it's wrong. It doesn't work. If you yeah. budge. Jazz breathes, you know, or yeah, improvised music breathes, you know, it, it's, it's got an elastic, 
if you teach it. It's like a conversation. Very, very hard to do well. Yeah. Um, but it does have this air about it. Yeah. All of it, even Louis Armstrong does. You know, there's and there's different volumes you play. Most rock and roll, especially now, is is just totally on top. But, you know, have you especially heard? now with machines and uh, monitors like that, it's just volume the whole time. Have you ever used drum program? I'm not sure. Probably. Have you heard the not 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 properly? Yeah. Not like um, not like Prince would use it. I just can't help but feel that music is going to become dated so quickly because of those sounds. Probably. Yeah. You could, well, there's a there's a whole other side to music, you know, which is the emotion of when you hear it, what you're doing, who you are, whatever. So then you get into this, it applies to me. Mickey Roker to me is seeing him one night with him and his, my wife, at Ronnie Scott. I've seen him before, but I mean, see him talking to him. Must have been you know, but that's not how I remember him playing, but that's how I remember him. Right. Uh, Mel Lewis is the same. You know? Mm -hmm. Actually, Mel Lewis, I've got so many records where I think he's wonderful on, but my memories of Mel are talking to him a few times. I've met him and that, and how nice a guy he was. You know. Were you ever nervous meeting any of these people? Or oh, exhilarated? Yeah. yeah, I'll never forget the first time I met Tony Williams. I was frightened to <laughs> say hello. Really? He actually came up to me and said hello. I was really scared to say hello to him. Yeah, it was at the Village Vanguard. When was this? I I'd been to see him play with uh, Mick Taylor, and he was with a band called uh, Lifetime, right. with Larry, Co uh, Larry Young and John McLaughlin. And uh, he left for me, Leo, so I didn't get to see him then. I'd seen him with Miles before that. He'd left and formed this band, which was fantastic. But I, oh, yeah. By the way. And... Uh, and then I saw him at the Vanguard soon after with uh, a piano player called Hank Jones, mm -hmm. Elvin's brother, actually, older brother, fantastic piano player. And uh, I think Ron Carter was the bass. And I was standing there, and I thought, should I go and say hello, should I go and say hello? <laughs> and he actually came and said hello to me, and I was so <laughs> thrilled. Sure. Yeah. But what I was saying about music was uh, it can do that to you, you know. So you might have, you might say, oh, 1991 is just going to disappear into the view on the, but it won't for a lot of people who were, who have might have been their first date, might have been right. uh, the first time they got drunk, might have been uh, some, whatever. But yeah. to them, it's it's more than printing in 1991. Prince, by the way, I have. I think Prince is probably the best of all the newer people. The Minneapolis Mozart. I think he's, he is. Do you? Yeah. In, in that world, there are people outside that world, this world, that are just as good, but you know, they're worried about relationship of one note against the other with a harmonic, you know, in other right. words, about composition. So, yeah, there are other than that, but, but, but for, in his position, doing what he does with what he does, he's by far and away the best, I think, most exciting Prince is. Yeah, me, anyway. I have to agree. Um, but I mean, you know, there are, I like Spin Doctor, actually. I'm sure they'd be great to go and see. Cause it's, yeah. I, I wouldn't want to see a machine going or something. You know, I don't really, but I don't think Prince does that live, does he? I mean, he has Not a much. band. And, you know, I'm sure he's a good player as well. I mean, you, you know, when you're that good, you, st you don't start nowhere. That's what I was saying about, you know, you can't 
beehive for these guys unless you've got a f- ground, you know. Yeah. On top of that, yeah, very good natural ability. Have you heard the remixes of the Stones albums that Virgin's put out again? No. <laughs> I'd be interested to hear your opinion. Oh, no, I never play our records. Yeah. I hear the McKeith plays them. Uh-huh. I haven't played this one, you know. Oh, they really... I mean, the... Uh, They've like redone Sticky Fingers and a bunch of other records. I'm sure they sound good, do they? Or sounds bad. different. Oh, different. It sounds right. very different. A lot more uh, rhythm guitar and Keith's vocals are boosted. They're probably a lot cleaner, I suppose. Are they remixed? Yeah. God, taking a chance. Huh? It, it sounds like a new record. It's really, oh, really? different. Some, some of it's dramatic. Oh. Yeah. Oh, I've I don't know if I'd know if it was. i tell you what, a couple of times downstairs, Key said put up a song, and it sounded remarkably good mm-hmm. to what I thought it was going to sound like. Um, so, and, and they're off the new, because we have them all downstairs for reference, you know, what you call a song, how did that go? Yeah. Uh, it probably is, you're, you're right. I must have another listen, I see. Do you have favorite um, tracks that you've done with the Stones for your playing? Or uh, from among your entire catalog? Like if, if one were to want to put together an essential Charlie Watts CD? I don't know, not really. Are you very self-critical? Yeah, I don't really like it. Much like that. What do you think your biggest limitation is as a musician? can't count, really. I must be one of the few few drummers in the world who've made a living at it who can't take what we, what's called fours and eights. Uh-huh. I, have a, I have a quintet of fantastically talented musicians. And uh, to them, taking choruses is nothing. And I mean going one. And 32 things later you go like right. that. Back on. You know. But it's never interested me. Mm-hmm. Now, the alto player with us, who's one of, I think he is the, the best, if not one of the best, alto saxophonists, phones alive today. Pete King said, uh, the reason is I've never done it. But it could be true. But they do go blank in the middle of it. How are you doing, Tyrone? Good. It's Ronnie's son. Oh. Um, you've always struck me as being like the calm in the eye of the hurricane when I've seen the Stones play. Do you ever do you do anything special to keep your sanity and keep grounded when you're on the road and millions of people are adulating? I don't listen to them. <laughs> Actually, yeah, not really. I try to keep away from it. If you hadn't, I'm been not that interested in it. Yeah. But, and uh, I don't really listen to them. That is not to say that it's nothing. Uh, the, 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 the best thing about doing this is, is going on. People applauding you when you come off and have people say how great they thought it was, whether it's at the Blue Note or at. Uh, the Shea or Giant Stadium. You know, that, that's the fantastic. That's the reward? No, I'm saying that is a fantastic reward. But uh, outside of that, I wouldn't sit and listen to any of the other stuff. You think you could have been happy in another profession? <laughs> well, I wouldn't know Mick and Keith or Ronnie Wood, would I? No. I was happy in another profession. I used to. I was in a studio and I was perfectly happy there. But I always wanted to be a drummer. I always wanted to play with Charlie Parker. When I was 13, I wanted to do that. Did you ever see him? No. No, No, he he wasn't allowed to play in England. Because of the heroin? No, no, because of uh, Musicians Union. Really? A a worse drawback. No, no Americans were between the... I think it was 31, something like that. 
on 53. So it all had to be on the wreck. The last guy to play in England was American officially billed and did a tour with someone like Fats Waller. Mm -hmm. Duke Ellington did one before in 1931, and then it was Fats Waller. And then the first one to come over officially and play was Big Bill Brunsey. Right. In, and, and then Lionel Hampton played a midnight concert. They got around it by starting a thing at midnight. Did you go to and that? He tore the place up. Did I go to that? No. I was not a Lionel Hampton fan at that time, but I wish I had gone. It's yeah. a legendary concert now in, in London. Uh, eyes. At that time, Lionel Hampton was absolutely, he still is actually. He's a fantastic musician, was, but he was at, on top then. Was there a rivalry among the musicians who were the first ones to come to America, like? between you and Keith Moon and Ringo Starr, did you sense anything like that? We didn't. Because people were always comparing Clapton to Beck and nothing, Page. It was nothing to do with us, we played in bands. It was whether the band got booked there. Yeah. But I people, mean, Ringo wouldn't have come here unless he was with the Beatles. Right. I wouldn't be here unless I was with the Stones, you know? Yeah. But you can say, well, that's stupid, because you are that, but I mean, I don't, at the time, you never thought that, I don't, in that way, I don't think, I don't know. Keith's not here to answer that, and uh, Ringo's not either, I don't know how Ringo... There was a, a paper rivalry between everybody, but that's bullshit. Yeah. I used to see Keith around, he's one of the nicest people. Crazy nice, though. Yeah. Nice, though. Very, very love Keith a lot, actually. Very sad. Yeah. Um, and Ringo I've always known. And I've always got on with and I always spoke to him. I've always liked Ringo. Yeah. In fact, of all the Beatles, him and John Lennon are the two that I know. I don't know the other two. I mean, I know, I've met them, and that, but I, I would... I've had conversations with both of them, and yeah. Ringo the most. Obviously, really, because drummers tend to do that anyway. But, um, my song. I love uh, this song. Yeah, so that. Well, this covers it. Thanks a lot for uh, okay. helping out. Fill your hundred pages, you mean? Well, you got some pages to fill. Okay. Thanks. Oh. By the way, I, I have to say, I was more excited about interviewing you than anyone else in the band. Well, I, I, I really admire your musicianship and your attitude, and uh, I love your playing, that's why. I'm a guitarist. Myself. Have I broken it all? No. Have I shattered it all now? No. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> no, you were nice to the guy in the back of the bus. Yeah, yeah. Thanks, Charlie. Well, you never know, he might be your manager next year. Uh-oh. <laughs> Hope not. I'll see you later. Thank you. In addition to drumming for the Rolling Stones, Charlie Watts also fronted the Charlie Watts Quintet, which gave him the opportunity to play his favorite music, jazz. He passed away on August 24th, 2021, and was survived by Shirley, his wife of 57 years, and their daughter and granddaughter. Before signing off, I want to thank my podcast producer, Nick Hunt, and the fine folks at the University of North Carolina Southern Folklife Collection. I hope you'll check out my other offerings on the YouTube channel. Have fun.